what are you going to do if you don't teach kids? That's just a question that came to me. Uh, all right, let's uh, open our scripture to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. And you know that that's where we're going to be uh, for today. And I don't know, we may be, we may be in the 22nd chapter of Luke uh, for a total of three more Sundays if I do not make uh, a little more rapid progress. Uh, today, uh, my prayer is that we may focus on verses uh, 24 through 38 and those uh, 14 verses uh, there that, uh, upon which we will direct our attention. And uh, we continue in the teaching uh, uh, of Jesus and the effort on the part of our Lord to help his followers understand what the kingdom of God is all about and what his teaching was all about. And so, Father, this morning I pray in the midst of life that you have let us live filled with its struggles and its temptations and all of its challenges. Oh, dear God, may we, more than the disciples did, catch a glimpse of what you were trying to teach. And may we see, Father, the message of your love and grace in these days. For Christ's namesake, we pray these things. Lord, let the Holy Bible take on life for us this morning, I pray. Amen. And I will step aside with one other statement. If you have an interest in the janitorial position available in our church, uh, then uh, I need to receive your application or your resume, excuse me, your resume uh, by tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. And so if you have an interest and have not submitted a resume, please do that by tomorrow morning uh, so that uh, we will be able to have some uh, things to look at uh, from which to base our decision and our choice. Uh, we do have some resumes, but some of you have expressed interest. And so if you do have an interest, please submit the resume. Now, did you find, did you quit looking for Luke 22 or did you really find it? If you have found Luke 22, remember that last week in the 22nd chapter, we focused on the Lord's Supper. And uh, uh, Jesus uh, taught them at uh, that uh, time uh, that there would be, there was one at the supper who would betray him. And uh, Luke records it and they began to discuss with themselves which of them it might be who was going to do this thing. And uh, if you were here last Sunday and experienced communion, it is my prayer that you were blessed. It is my prayer that it was a time of, uh, of uh, strengthening of your own commitment to the Lord, your own fresh, new sense of relationship with Him, and that out of that, you left our service last Sunday morning blessed. Now, I want us to see something uh, that uh, Jesus didn't have a full week in between uh, the initiation institution of the Lord's Supper and what is to follow in verse 24. He had told them at this supper that there was going to be one who would betray him. And they lost sight of the Lord's Supper. That's so easy to do, is it not? And this Lord's Supper that was experienced by the apostles was the last one that Jesus would share on this earth. And he said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. I will not partake of this meal with you until we do so in the kingdom. Sometimes we think it's a long time in between times. I said this last week, in between times when we observe communion in our church. Sometimes we think it's a long time. But Jesus is waiting until we all get to heaven. He will not observe communion again 
until we all get, to have, uh, all get together in heaven and we sit at his banqueting table there. And uh, so Jesus is waiting uh, for the next time in which uh, he can observe communion together with us. But notice, if you will, that that sense of community and that sense of family that comes at the observance of communion was what our Lord sought to initiate and to institute. And he also said that this supper would usher in a new uh, covenant in his blood, a new covenant in his name. And so in that time, there was somebody there at uh, that communion event who was going to betray him. And he just called that person out and said, there is somebody here who's going to do this. And the, uh, the attitudes then, the mindset of the rest of the apostles began to shift and change. Who's going to betray him? Wh which one of you? Who is going to be the one to do the dastardly deed? And uh, uh, they lost sight of the communion aspect and the initiation of the new covenant, and yet that is what was in the mind of Jesus. So often, friends, what is on God's mind never gets into our mind, and I wonder how we may feel this morning. What is in our mind this morning is what is in our mind commensurate with what is in the mind of God for us. And so then there was another thing. They began to wonder who was going to uh, betray him. And in verse 24, where we pick up the scripture, for, the scripture focus for this morning, there was a second thing that began to claim their attention, and that was a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. And here was the observance of communion. Here was the observance and the initiation of the Lord's Supper. And two things interrupted the glory, the joy, the deep spiritual impact that that could have had. And oh, dear friends, I come back and say to us that so often we as humans today allow things to come in and destroy, thereby we miss the deep spiritual impact that God intends for us in worship. And uh, the second thing that they began to discuss among themselves, who, who's going to be the greatest? Now, I want you to remember that, G, uh, that Luke already has dealt with this uh, the, uh, in the Gospel of Mark. Mark deals with this uh, thing that Jesus taught. And so look at what he is beginning to teach them now. And do not forget that this comes. They had not left the room where communion had been observed. You may not call it communion, uh, whatever you call it, we just call it in Protestant circles, the Lord's Supper, where that had been instituted, initiated in the context of a new covenant. They had not left the room. And before they left the room, they began to accuse one another. Oh, it, I bet it's you that's going to betray him. You know, isn't that the way human minds work? It's if we don't know something, we just pick out somebody and say, oh, I bet it's him or her. No, no, I don't think it is. And they'll get in an argument about who is to be the betrayer. And then the second thing that happened right hard on the heels of that is a dispute of which one of them was to be greatest in this kingdom that Jesus had kept talking about. Now, he's going to be talking about his kingdom in the verses to come. But here is his teaching. The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. But let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader become as the servant. For who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Do not forget 
that John added a detail, the, the writer of the Gospel of John, uh, added a detail that uh, uh, Luke does not add, that at this supper, in the context of saying the bread represented his body, which was to be broken for them, his blood, his, uh, the cup represented his blood, which was to be shed for them. In the context of those great, deep, theological, and blessed teachings, who's going to betray me? And who's going to be the greatest? And Jesus said, what goes on in the kingdoms of this world is not what my kingdom is about. And John adds a wonderful and glorious detail that we don't find in the other gospel. At that table, Jesus arose, took a towel, and wrapped that towel around him, and found a basin of water. And he took that basin of water and that towel. And he went from disciple to disciple. And he washed their feet. Now look at and read again what Luke says about that. Look at, look at what, how Luke says the teaching of that marvelous truth about servanthood in verses 25. And 26, the, the kings of the Gentiles are lorded over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it's not so among you, but let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader become as the servant. When Jesus was attempting to share with them the glorious truth of the purpose of his human existence, which was that he become the savior of mankind and the sacrifice that was being offered was the sacrifice of his body and his blood. When that truth was being taught, the people around him were wondering about who was going to do something bad to him and others then later were wondering who was to be the greatest. And he said, the one who is to be the greatest in my kingdom will be the one who is the greatest servant. Expresses to the nth degree the role of servanthood and will take upon himself or herself that role and that elevates in God's kingdom the strength and the importance and the vitality of eternal life. Now in this life, it is not so. It is not that way. But it is the difference of the kingdom. Please see if you and I, if you and I will and if we may. Please see the teaching that Jesus never, from which Jesus never strayed. He always stayed on target to teach about the kingdom of his father. His kingdom. The kingdom of eternity. Jesus never strayed from those teachings and he stayed on target. Who is greater will be the one who is the one to serve. And you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And there is an entire denomination of people who use the, this uh, little vignette of Jesus' teaching to teach that they are going, each of them will have their own individual kingdom. But I want to come back and say to you, friends, that I do not study the Bible with that mindset. I study the Bible with a mindset that the only kingdom that is going to be in eternity is the kingdom of God Almighty. And Jesus 
will preside over that in the power of the Holy Spirit. There will not be a multiplicity of kingdoms in eternity. There will be only one kingdom, and if you can agree with that, that would warrant an amen. But if you cannot agree with that, I'm begging you please to study the scripture and study the example of the life of our Lord who taught always to the very end of this teaching experience even that there would be His kingdom and that it, that kingdom would be an eternal one and would be 180 out from the kingdoms of this world would be so different. And just as uh, my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you, and he didn't finish that, I grant you that kingdom with me is to be understood. It is not that I grant you another kingdom. It is that the Father has granted me the kingdom and I grant you that kingdom as well. And in that kingdom, you will have two things to do that Jesus said. Oh, you will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. There's not going to be a lot of kingdoms. We will eat and drink at the table in the kingdom of God with King Jesus. And he is to be our king. Another thing that we will do, and not from our own separate kingdoms, but in his kingdom, he will grant to us the glory of the authority and power of heaven. We join with him in that. And there will be one great, glorious, heavenly expression of power and authority in the name of Jesus our Lord. And in verse 31, he then immediately turns to Simon and he said, Simon, Simon. I don't know if Simon wasn't paying attention or not. You know, Simon, Simon. Oh, and got his attention. Simon, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. I want you to look at verse 32. Don't go home without this verse in your heart. I have prayed for you. What was Jesus' prayer for Simon? That his faith would not fail. Look at that. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I struggled with that. Don't you? Do you think that Jesus ever prayed a prayer that the Father didn't answer? Raised that question in some folk. Like we all do, right? Because you're not sure how I'm going to answer it. And you don't want to commit yourself too early. I don't think the son ever asked his father anything that his father didn't give him. Right. Now look at this. Simon, I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And immediately our minds go to what's going to happen before this night expires in the Bible record. When Jesus was arrested and taken before the authorities, here is Simon in the courtyard who has been assured by the master of the universe, the master of glory. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And this little girl comes up to him and said, you're one of his, aren't you? No, hmm, not me. A little while later, you're one of his. No, I'm not. You are one of his. And one of the gospel writers says, I detect by your language. You talk just like a southerner. <laughs> you are one of his. And Simon Peter, so aggravated that he cursed. 
And he said, I told you I'm not. I got to tell you, I preached a lot of sermons. And I talked about how weak Peter's faith could get. Until I got hold of this truth. That it wasn't the faith that Simon Peter lost. It was his hope. God gave the world Jesus Christ. Jesus walked among those apostles for three years. And taught them everything that he could teach and they could learn. Or that he could teach and they refused to learn. And it was that one who said, Simon, I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And my kingdom is to be established. He had just shared with them when he said this cup represents my blood of the new covenant, i.e. the new kingdom. This bread represents my body, i.e. of my kingdom. And I shed it all for you that my kingdom may be established. And Simon Peter's hope, once again, even in those times of great trial, Simon Peter's hope was still there. But when he saw Jesus on trial in Pilate's courtyard, all hope was gone. It didn't work out. And his hope was dashed. And I want to submit to us, ladies and gentlemen, when our hope is gone, we do some dumb things. I want you to study the New Testament while you're not doing anything, ladies, but washing dishes and uh, uh, stuff like that that you do. And gentlemen, while you're not doing anything but taking a 45-minute break when you had a 10-minute break allotted to you. Okay, want, want you to study the Bible this week. And I want you to look. I want you to look at this truth that in the gospel, Luke is the only gospel writer who mentions the word hope. Not in Matthew, not in Mark, not in John. And Luke mentions it three times in relationship to some human activities and events. Not until the resurrection of our Lord and the ascension into glory, do the disciples begin to live the truth that Jesus sought for three years to teach them that we are to have faith and hope in that faith for the fulfillment of God's glory. Amen. That's all we've got. And even to the very time of the initiation of that new covenant in his blood and the power of his body, even until that was completed, the disciples never got it. But it was Simon Peter who later got that truth. And read the book of 1 Peter where he says, My hope is renewed. Read the book of Romans where it says that our hope will never disappoint. What is it for which we hope? Are you hoping for an earthly kingdom by which you can sit at the head of the table and be the benefactor of all of those around you? Are you in hope in this life that you can so arrange health issues? financial issues, religious issues, that you can control it all and make everything work as smooth as silk? In what do we hope? 
And Jesus sought to teach the disciples to hope in the resurrection and the power of his kingdom. And they came to understand that as they walked along. They didn't understand it before they got there. But he asked them to hope. These are things about my kingdom. And only after his ascension, resurrection and ascension back into glory did they begin to get it. The great apostle Paul probably wrote more about it than any of the other New Testament writers. But Simon Peter wrote about it. The author of the book of Hebrews, and I'll leave that statement there by itself, also wrote about it. But friends, I want to submit to you this morning that my faith and your faith needs to be directed to Almighty God. And in the context of that faith, that's all we have to hope for. Is it enough? Immediately I will ask you, then what else is there? Simon Peter caught a glimpse of this when he didn't quite know the extent of what he was talking about and said in response to Jesus' question to the disciples, will you also go away? Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? And I say to us, if we have not fixed our hope in Jesus Christ on the basis of our faithful relationship with him, in what do we hope? Friends, that's all we have. Now Simon Peter didn't like it because Jesus said to him, <laughs> I've prayed for you uh, and once you've turned that your, faith would, that your faith would be strengthened and you would strengthen your brethren. And Simon Peter got all torqued off at the Lord a little dab and he said to him, Lord, Lord I'm, I'm ready to go to prison. I'm even ready to die for you. And Jesus said, yeah, the rooster won't even crow till you've denied me three times. <laughs> now, our faith can be shaken and our hope can be shaken. But Jesus prayed that our faith would not fail. It's our hope that gets weak. Oh, I hope this and I hope that. And it is our hope that gets weak and causes this great, the great struggle. Renew our hope in our Lord. Then he goes on and he said, When I sent you out without a purse and a bag and sandals, you didn't lack anything, did you? And they agreed with him. Yeah, no, we didn't. And in verse 36, the Lord goes on. But now, let him who has a purse take it along. Likewise also a bag. And let him who has no sword sell his robe and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. Now here's what was written about Jesus. He was numbered with the transgressor. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. I want to say that to encourage your hope this morning. I don't know what it is for which you're hoping. But I want to say from the word of Almighty God itself, these things that Jesus said, that which refers to me will be fulfilled. Very quickly, two or three things. What does the Bible say in reference to our Lord? I give unto thee eternal life. And if you come and believe in me, you shall never perish. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. 
gift of God and not of works. Or some of we Baptists would run around boasting about it. But it is by faith. And we hope in the fulfillment of that faith that is spoken of about Jesus. That which is spoken of him is to be fulfilled. What was spoken of Jesus? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, thank you, God. I won't ever leave you and I won't ever forsake you. Thank you, Father, for that. Because I can peg my hope that has been written about him. And by his own words, it's going to be fulfilled. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No man shall pluck them out of my hand. For my Father who gave them all, gave them to me as greater than all. No man is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That's written about our Lord. And then all of the prophetic writings of the Old Testament. Written about Jesus are to be fulfilled. Take that home with you today. And place your hope in those truths. Please take those things home with you today. I don't know when it's going to be fulfilled. I don't know how it's going to be fulfilled. The when or the how is not my business. To believe it is my business. Taking the steps up here, I'll turn to you and say, and it is also your business. That which, is, that which refers to me has its fulfillment. Now they weren't keeping up with the master. Like always, some one of them was still wondering who was going to betray him. Some one of them was wondering who was going to be the most important. And he was teaching these truths that extend beyond this realm and this world and creation into his holy kingdom and they didn't stay caught up with him. And so they said, after Jesus had told them back there, now let him who has a purse take it along, also a bag, and let him who has no sword sell his robe and buy one. They missed that great teaching in verse 37. And they said in verse 38, Lord, <laughs> look, Here's a couple of swords. They're kind of beat up. They're not like the Roman swords uh, of the Roman garrison. But we got two swords among us. That was the only thing they got out of all that teaching. Isn't that amazing? That was the only thing they got out of that teaching. Lord, you're telling us now to take a bag and a purse and swords. He said, when I sent you out, you didn't need any of those things because I was with you. But now the new covenant, I'm not going to be with you. And so you're going to need to take your bag and your purse and your sword. You're going to need to be able to defend yourself because he has sent us among the wolves among the enemy and I want to say to us that any church that refuses to invade the realm of the enemy is a church that is not being obedient to the command of our Lord do you know one of the great things God has let this congregation do is invade the realm of the enemy oh my soul scares the socks off me because I know that some of you are going to fall. I, I just, when you go to war, are there going to be casualties? Certainly there are. And I know that when we invade the realm of the enemy, there will be casualties. 
but do not forget this, that the Lord Jesus, by teaching, has prayed that our faith not fail. And then by his own teaching in the life of Simon Peter, don't allow your hope to cause you, the absence of your hope to cause you to say or do something stupid. Keep firm hold of your hope that is firmly fixed in Jesus. Now there is that curious little phrase at the end of verse 38, which says, it's enough. What is the antecedent of it? Oh, came to church, and here's an old man who's forgotten everything he ever knew about grammar, trying to give us a, a lesson in grammar before we go. What does it refer to? I sound like President Clinton wanting to know what is, is. What does it refer to? And I submit to you this, that Jesus had taught them and told them and they had not gotten very much of it because what he was telling them was about his eternal kingdom and they were so firmly fixed in this here and now kingdom, they couldn't make the, the leap mentally and emotionally. But at the end of his time of teaching, ready to leave that upper room, he said, it's enough. What I've told you is enough. Now, how much faith does that take from us to believe that what Jesus has told us is enough? And we firmly fix our hope, our eternal hope, on what he's told us. Will you do it? If your hope is weak this morning, you may want to come to the altar and pray. If you feel your faith is weak, you may want to come to the altar and pray. But do not allow Satan to take away the sense of your hope for eternity. Because with all my soul, I believe that this is the focus of these verses to keep our hope firmly fixed in the light of everything that's going on, to keep our hope firmly fixed upon our Lord. If you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, come and say, Pastor, I need to pray and receive Christ as my Savior. If you have never been baptized, you may want to come and say, Pastor, I want to pray about consider baptism. I know I need to do that and I want to consider it. If you're here this morning and your faith is weak, your hope a little shaky, you may just want to come to the altar and pray. I want to stand in the presence of our Heavenly Father.